And now I'll call the Committee of the Whole meeting of Monday, January 11th, 2021 to order and request everyone turn off their cell phones for the duration of the meeting. As there are members attending remotely, I'll ask the acting clerk to do a roll call and ask members to respond verbally. I will also ask when the members aren't speaking, they turn their mics off so we don't experience any feedback. Okay, Councillor Bush. Present. Councillor Carlucci. Present. Councillor Martin McKinnon. No. Councillor Shane McKinnon. Present. Councillor McKay. Present. Councillor Price. Present. Mayor Wilson. Seeing none. Okay. I would like to call for declarations of pecuniary interest and the general nature thereof under Municipal Conflict of Interest Act with respect to the agenda for this meeting. Don't see any. I would like to begin by acknowledging with respect that we are in Treaty 3 territory and that the land on which we are gathered is in the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Métis people. We have no delegations this evening. I invite, uh, we have one presentation. I invite Councilor Shane McKinnon and Ms. Cheryl Edwards of the City of Dryden Working Circle to make this evening's presentation. Shane, Cheryl. Thank you, uh, Deputy Mayor Carlucci. Um, I wonder if we can get our presentation up on the shared screen. Thank you. And Thank you, and, and your, your Worship Mayor Wilson, I don't know if he's online right now, Deputy Mayor Carlucci, Council Members, staff, and those watching online, good evening. Uh, on behalf of the Working Circle, thank you for allowing us this time on your agenda to present this important issue. So our recommendation uh, to Council this evening is that Dryden City Council consider the recommendation of the Working Circle that the name of colonization avenue be changed through the asset naming bylaw of the city of dryden and that the city uh, dryden city council endorse the working circle to develop a process and present to council at least three alternate names for their consideration and uh, by way of background and i know that the uh, council is is quite familiar with our, our strategic plan uh, but just to restate that the vision in our strategic plan is Dryden is a vibrant, safe, healthy, and inclusive community with a diverse, a diverse economy providing an exceptional quality of life. And of course, the, something that goes along with that is uh, uh, some of the, the goals we have set in the strategic plan and certainly uh, the one that's pertinent this evening, a number of them are, but uh, that we will continue to foster positive relationships with Indigenous peoples and neighboring First Nations communities. Uh, I know that we had a recent presentation by the Working Circle, but just to, to mention the Working Circle again, um, it's made up of uh, five Indigenous community members and five senior uh, city representatives. And some of them are online tonight, and I would like to uh, introduce uh, our co-chair, Cheryl Edwards, Mr. Neil McLeod, Ms. Lisa Couchette, Mr. Lloyd Napish, and Mr. Ted Mitchell, and of course, uh, representing the city are Councillors Bush, Councillor Price, uh, CA Roger, CAO Roger Nesbitt, HR Manager Jennifer Peakhouse, and myself. And the mandate of the Working Circle uh, is to identify issues important to Indigenous, Triton's Indigenous community, recommend actions the city can take to improve the experience of Indigenous people and propose ways the community can bring together Indigenous and non-Indigenous uh, residents. And I would like to think that the recommendation we're bringing to you tonight touches on all three of those uh, mandates. Um, I'd like to uh, turn things over to Cheryl Edwards to do a background on this issue. Thank you, Councillor McKinnon. The history of Colonization Avenue in Dryden. 
We are looking at the renaming of Colonization Avenue in Dryden, and this issue has been debated for the past few years. The definition and process of the word colonization carries negative meaning for Indigenous people. This is a constant reminder of Canada's early history of atrocities towards Indigenous populations. These atrocities controlled Indigenous people, including residential school, which sought to destroy our language and our culture. The 60s scoop, which was another, another event to remove children from Indigenous communities to be raised in non-Indigenous homes. Again, removing language and culture. There are many examples in Canada's history that were direct attacks on Indigenous people dating all the way back to the Quebec Act of 1774, which was pre-Confederation. The word colonization is more than just the name of a street. This word glorifies the process of an attempt to destroy Indigenous people. And in terms of this historical context, of the founding and settling of Dryden and its colonization road or avenue, it's a partial history. It's a partial history without indigenous perspective. Because even at the time of these early documents that we're about to look at, the movement of our local First Nations people was greatly controlled and it was limited. Uh, our movement was limited by the Indian agent and the past system which kept First Nations people from leaving their reserves from 1885 into the 1940s. So again, the, the uh, Indigenous perspective was not a part of this naming process. The other thing is Colonization Road, as they were so called at that time, were built to give settlers access to colonized lands. They were constructed across what is now Ontario following the passage of the Public Lands Act by the provincial province of Canada in 1853 and were later transferred to the Ontario municipalities in 1913. When we look at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada had many recommendations to improve the relationships between Indigenous people and non-Indigenous communities. Many want to jump at the reconciliation part without understanding the truth. The truth involves our past, our history as a country, a province, a town, or a city. And we need to acknowledge the pain of that truth. While the city of Dryden is in a unique place in our city's history by having the opportunity to rename a street that it is a negative historical reminder to Indigenous people. While the discussion regarding truth and reconciliation is helpful, reconciliation through action is what will truly build relationships. Elders, elders tell us that in life, we are presented with challenges. If we only focus on our emotional reactions, we will miss the opportunity to learn from those challenges. By using strong minds and good hearts, we will correctly see the opportunity, not only for ourselves, but many others. Thank you, Cheryl. Uh, if we can move to the video. Buju, Ozawagi Shik Dishnikas, Name Dotim, Migazi Sagi Gun Dochi. My name is Lloyd Napish. I'm a community member of Eagle Lake First Nation, and I'm proud to call Dryden my home as well. I've gone to school here, I've been involved with various local organizations, and I've worked here for pretty much close to a decade. I just wanted to bring to your attention an issue that has come up in the past, but we haven't really seen much action on. I'm talking about Colonization Avenue. Now, I know some of you might be thinking, well, what's the big deal? It's just a street name. It was named that by people from many, many years ago. 
people I'm not related to, so why should I care? Well, in this video, I've gathered local Indigenous voices and some non-Indigenous voices to raise some awareness about this issue. Uh, so, you know, to define colonization, it's when, uh, like, a colonizer um, basically uh, conquers an area of land and uh, takes control over the uh, Indigenous people of that area. And that's kind of why, um, that's kind of why we don't want a street in our city to be named colonization because that's what it stands for and we're hoping that you know between then and now that there would have been an understanding that colonization is really unethical and it's not something to be celebrated um, I think we should celebrate that area with a different name so I, I feel if people knew the history and the connotation behind colonization they would at least I hope they would want to change the street name if people knew more about Canadian history and the dark side of it, and what the Canadian government did, particularly to Indian, Indigenous children and families, by ripping them apart, segregating them, taking them away from their culture, any Canadian would want to take a small step towards rectifying that. Somebody asked, why is Colonization Avenue, the name, such a big deal? When colonization happened in Canada, it was a great thing for the European settlers who came here. People got new land, people got new farms, people got out of oppressive circumstances and came to a country where they could observe whatever faith they wanted without oppression. For our indigenous brothers and sisters, it was a disaster. Millions of people died. People lost their homes, they lost their land, they were forcibly relocated. It was an absolute disaster. And so when we hold events like the Little Bands Tournament, when we have indigenous housing organizations coming to town, when we have indigenous government organizations coming here, when we have people visiting this community, and you see Colonization Avenue, Colonization for our indigenous brothers and sisters was one of the greatest crimes in history, and it's an insult. As somebody who's lived and worked in Dryden for many, many years, I don't want to be insulting our visitors when they come here. That's not fair. It's not who we are, and it's not what we should be standing for. So I think we should be changing the name. The idea of changing the name of Colonization Avenue has been brought up more than once in our area over the last decade. The two most common arguments I've heard against making the change are the investment required to change the name when our city is already in tight economic shape, and the administrative hassle that it would cause for residents of the street to undergo an address change. I've also heard most people say they disagree with colonization, both in theory and in practice, and agree that it was a despicable undertaking that exists in Canada's historical past, but that colonization is just a word, and the street was named in a different time, and it wouldn't accomplish anything practical to change it. But the thing is, naming a street after something or someone in the first place is typically an act of respect or celebration. And we have to ask ourselves, whether colonization is an institution that we want to respect and celebrate in our town. In 2009, our Prime Minister claimed that Canada had no history of colonialism. I was away at school at the time, and the first thing I thought of when I heard his comment on the airwaves was our Colonization Avenue in my hometown, 1,800 kilometers away, knitted neatly by name right into our infrastructure. Some may say that a street name is not worth changing because it's only a word or only a symbol, but as language using people, we know that words and symbols matter and are powerful. The issue is that leaving it there as it is, normalizing it and claiming it's not doing any harm, that's symbolic too. It's no surprise that we're living in a time where we, we've become politically correct, sensitive. It seems like um, we have to watch all our words and, and that I think is a big challenge because I, I firmly believe that our ancestors of years ago were not so careful and saying what they wanted, when they wanted, how they wanted and without even thinking that words can hurt. And um, 
we're in a time where we're, we're becoming more sensitive to that because hurt and causing pain is something that we don't want to do. We're also in a time of truth and reconciliation. And we have to make every effort, even small efforts, to make things right, to uh, be inclusive, to be sensitive to each other's needs, and to um, make change happen. For years now, the conversation about the Colonization Avenue street sign has come up in discussion with our students. There are many opinions um, that I've heard Lots of them are feelings of outrage, shock, and trauma over the fact that it still remains up. Um, another thing that was surprising, though, in asking our students was the number of students that didn't actually know what the word colonization means. I'd be willing to bet there are some adults that also don't know that. I know for a fact if I were to ask half the kids at Giant High School, what colonization means, they wouldn't know. Um, and I'm not saying it's their fault because they weren't taught that, you know? It's the system. People are being failed by the system. And it's also up to people to educate themselves on that kind of stuff as well. I feel like if the name of Colonization Avenue was changed, that would be a step in the right direction for decolonization. Um, it hurts me to be reminded of colonization because my grandparents were affected by residential schools, 60 scoops, um, and that's a trigger for them as well. Residential schools, the 60 scoop, and the Indian Act were all tools of colonization that led to the cultural genocide of indigenous peoples and created a long line of intergenerational trauma that continues to affect the health and well-being of indigenous people today. Lately, we see a lot of people reevaluating the symbols around them that promote or contribute to racism or colonialism. Change is happening and we should follow suit. We're way overdue for it. Many other communities in our area have already made this or similar changes quite some time ago. Removing Colonization Avenue is crucial as Canada tries to take steps towards truth and reconciliation. There are many, many other things that need to change systemically, and changing a sign may seem trivial, but it sends the message to Dryden residents that our local government will not support or promote racism or colonialist ideals. It encourages those who are ignorant about the issue to educate themselves on what colonization really is and how it's a dark part of our history. It shows people that we're capable of self-reflection, growth, and change. If Dryden is committed to building stronger relationships with Indigenous peoples, communities, and leadership, a simple and easy way to do this is to change the name of Colonization Avenue to something that celebrates or commemorates the Indigenous people whose land we live on. As treaty people, we made a deal to honor and respect the land we are on, as well as its original caretakers, the Anishinaabe. We are doing a disservice to them by maintaining a symbol that is hurtful and traumatizing. If we want to show Indigenous communities that we are striving for genuine reconciliation and respect, we, as an accepting and loving community, will move forward with changing the name of Colonization Avenue. And it's up to Dryden, Ontario, and the citizens or the leadership and what they want, what they want to do with it. You know, maybe uh, most don't understand it. I don't know. I, I can't say. You know, uh, and uh, non-native population don't understand it. To them, it's also just a fancy word for a street. What's the matter with the word Treaty Avenue? I think that would be more powerful for not only our own young people, but also the young people of their young people. You know, how to start to, uh, to being, you know, uh, to view each other as equals.
Well, there you have it. I hope that you found this video informative and it's helped shed some light on this issue. I just wanted to give a sincere thanks and miigwech to everybody who participated in this video and to you as well for watching. Dryden, we are capable of doing better. For the benefit of our children and all future generations, let us abolish the name Colonization Avenue. If you support this cause, please write in to Dryden City Council, share this video on social media, and talk to your family, your friends, and your peers about it. Together, we can make this change. Together, we can walk this path of reconciliation. Thank you, and make wish. Thank you, uh, Lloyd uh, is with us this evening, uh, Council, and I want to extend my thanks uh, for <laughs> for an excellent video. And uh, Lloyd, if you would, please extend our thanks to those involved. And uh, I, I believe we have one more presentation later on uh, uh, by, uh, by Lloyd as well. So thank you. Uh, if we can move on to, uh, to maps, uh, this is a representation of the, one of the earliest maps uh, that we could find. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Tyler Peacock and Ted Mitchell for uh, not only the maps, but their historical perspectives on these maps. Um, and this map is from uh, 1896, and it illustrates uh, the uh, division uh, or the survey of Van Horn and Wainwright townships and in those surveys, uh, they created a colonization road down the center of each township. Um, and of course, these uh, roads were uh, used to develop settlers or uh, to encourage settlers uh, to colonize the areas um, under the uh, uh, Lands Act of 1853. Um, there's also a reference in these maps to uh, the Canadian Pacific Railroad, which is on in almost every map, of course. Uh, Barclay Station is identified, and uh, uh, reserve land, uh, indigenous reserve land on Eagle Lake. Uh, the next map is uh, uh, from 1898, and it shows the development of additional surrounding townships. There's uh, a little bit more information that sort of, uh, came with this map, and I just want to uh, quote uh, Mr. Yeomans uh, that said a bridge and a dam have been built by the government across Wabagoon River at Dryden. The government has also built about 20 miles of colonization road, which the settlers have uh, supplemented by as much more. Uh, park and cemetery lots have also been laid out adjacent to the town. So that was, again, was in 1898. And moving uh, to our next map, uh, the third map is, is believed to be created in 1901 and is a reflection of the existing and future uh, town development. And the consensus is that uh, Colonization Avenue or Road was the first road named in town and it preceded even uh, Government Road, which uh, still exists today. Uh, and Cheryl mentioned that uh, with the incorporation of the town of Dryden in 1910, uh, this was followed soon after in uh, 1913 uh, when the government transferred municipal uh, colonization roads and similar roads over to municipalities. Um, and just moving to, to Cheryl. Next slide. You might be on mute, Cheryl. Sorry. Uh, with some of the findings with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission findings, specifically um, number 43, to fully adopt and implement the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People as the framework for reconciliation. And if we refer to the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People on Article 15, Indigenous people have the right to the dignity and diversity of their cultures, traditions, histories, and aspirations, which will be appropriately reflected in education and public information. 
States shall take effective measures in consultation and cooperation with Indigenous peoples concerned to combat prejudice and eliminate discrimination and to promote tolerance, understanding and good relations among Indigenous people and all other segments of society. And there is a link to the justice.gc.ca on, on this page. Thank you. And I, I do want to mention uh, that we are certainly not alone in our recommendation. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Um, and I have uh, encouraged council uh, to view this documentary called uh, Colonization Road. It's on C CBC GEM. Uh, it's one of their productions, and certainly we can make the address known uh, to the public. But the uh, focus is, of this production uh, is our neighbor to the south, Fort Francis. Uh, but the facts of this documentary can easily be transposed uh, to our own community. Uh, next. Thank you. And uh, lastly, on, on background, we have recently passed uh, the asset naming policy. I know council are, are familiar with it. But I just want to uh, review a couple of items in it. And the first one is 6.1. Uh, so a proposal to rename a street is to be made using the street naming application through the building and planning department and at a minimum it is to include and there's a number of ingredients. And I know that uh, looking at the agenda that's going to come up later on in the council's agenda this evening. Um, also 6.4 is, uh, is following 60 days public notice city council shall consider the proposed name. So we have um, some time here to, to get uh, some feedback on uh, the proposals. And uh, lastly, just to point out uh, another uh, paragraph in the policy, where City Council deems an existing, existing street name to be inappropriate, it can choose to waive Article 6.1.3 in the street naming application, uh, application which I think will be the subject of some conversation again later on in our meeting. So just uh, possibly turn it back over to uh, Cheryl here to restate uh, what our recommendation is and then what we're going to do about that recommendation. Thank you, Shane. The City of Dryden Working Circle is asking for two considerations from Council. The first one is to invoke provisions of the asset naming bylaw and agree to change the name of Colonization Avenue based upon the preceding background and history. Second, that the working circle be given car carriage of creating and executing a process to find three suitable street names for council, council's consideration to replace the name colonization. And just to, uh, to, to go through step, uh, step one, uh, and certainly we need to uh, educate the community and in particular the property owners and occupiers of colonization at uh, and we'd like that to take place immediately. And uh, through that education, uh, we, uh, we originally had planned to go door to door and we're prepared to do that as a, uh, a working circle. But in uh, regards to COVID restrictions and safety, uh, we have decided to do a mail out contact with each resident, uh, owner or occupier of property on uh, Colonization Avenue and, and present uh, information packages, which will include checklists and uh, references to some of the online material that you've seen tonight. Um, and then uh, through a virtual forum is to conduct a public meeting, uh, also to use social media and uh, our Working Circle webpage to educate people on the rationale behind making this, uh, this move. Step two in our process. We are seeking public input on renaming of the avenue. It should be noted that the working circle encourages all submissions, whether they reflect indigenous content or not. The submission must be dignified and respectful to of all in our community. The name search will be achieved through uh, a request for name suggestions from those res residents, owners, 
or occupiers of colonization now, a request for the community schools to possibly assign students a home, a home assignment where they may engage uh, in their home and in reason and suggestions for the new name. Uh, or a request from community seniors to submit names with their knowledge of our history of diversity and growth. And finally, a general call for submissions from the public on renaming of the street. In terms of step three of this process, the working circle will review the submissions and create a short list of three avenue names and a recommendation to city council. All submissions will be kept on file for the review of the city council should that be their desire. It is hoped that the city council will then choose a new name and pass a resolution to the effect of which will be officially enacted on the 21st of June, 2021. Step four, uh, through the resources of the city, uh, we are going to recommend a, a guidance page and a temporary helpline be set up to assist residents uh, with the process of uh, uh, address changes and, and things that are associated with that. Um, and we would reproduce uh, some of that information and contact information on the uh, working circle site. Um, and in conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Nesbitt, I understand that uh, that uh, particular helpline and guidance uh, can be set up with, uh, with the assistance of current staff uh, who will be given the proper information. In terms of our timeline and our uh, culminating event, our presentation was scheduled for this month with, uh, with the City Council and the naming process and the, uh, the suggestion, I guess, of different names will be from January until March. The full recommendation and council vote we are hoping uh, will occur in April. The planning process and preparation uh, in May. And the naming of the, a naming community event would happen on Indigenous Peoples Day on June 21st. And just a, a note in regards to the financial implications uh, between signage and the information packages themselves, uh, some uh, media notices that we would put out. Uh, the public meeting appears at this point uh, to be a virtual meeting and uh, additional resources that we would need. There's very minimal cost to this. Um, and as mentioned, uh, we could likely do this with resources already uh, contained in the city. Now I think we have a, a second video, if I'm not mistaken. City of Dryden would want to continue to use this name on its streets. My name is Bruce Taylor. For the past 22 years, I've been a resident and business owner in the City of Dryden. I feel that as a community, we should all be able to agree that colonization is a very dark part of our nation's history, which does not need to be glorified in the street name. The word itself is hurtful and offensive to many. The time has come to change the name of Colonization Avenue to better reflect the positive, open, an inclusive community that Dryden is now. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Karen Seeley. Macaulay and Partners is happy to support the new name of Colonization Avenue. Hey there, it's Darren Anderson from IG Wealth Management in Dryden, and I support the renaming of Colonization Avenue. Thanks. 
Hi, I'm Carly Brown from Lokasenga Yoga here in Dryden. I fully support the renaming of Colonization Avenue. I feel as a community, we can do so much better together. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tarja Patel. I am a resident of Dryden and a teacher at Dryden High School. I believe if you have the opportunity to make a small change that will have a long lasting positive impact, then you do so. I think getting rid of a street in colonization will do just that. So please join me and support getting rid of the street name colonization. Thank you. I'm Sheila Wilson and I support changing the name of Colonization Avenue. I am in full support of changing the name of Colonization Avenue to something that will honor Indigenous people. Hi, my name is Adam Moyer and I support the name change. I've been living in northwestern Ontario for over seven years and I'm always overwhelmed with the hospitality, the love and the care and the compassion that our local indigenous show me. And as a person of faith and of a pastor, we ought to extend that compassion and love back to them. It's David at Connell Reed. I want to indicate that I fully support the renaming of Colonization Avenue in Dryden. Hi. I'm Hattie Bann. And I'm Carl Eisner. We're both from DARN. And we both support changing the name of Colonization Avenue. Yuval Harari says that we should study history so that we can free ourselves from the past. I would encourage anyone who does not know the history of Colonization Road to learn what it means, not just to our First Nations community members, but to all of us. Hi, I'm Allie from Ella Lynn's, and my sister Jill and I support the name change of Colonization Avenue in Dryden, Ontario. We support changing the name of Colonization Avenue! Hi, I'm Dr. Neil McLeod from McLeod Chiropractic. And I'm Dr. Stephen Friesen from Hometown Chiropractic. And for almost the past 20 years, Dr. Friesen and myself have had the privilege and opportunity to work with people in Northwest Ontario and the Dryden and surrounding area. And this is a wonderful community of respect and diversity. And together, we would like to state our unified support for changing the name of Colonization Avenue. This is Bruce Cook, Chief of Staff at the Dryden Regional Health Center. I support action to change the name of Colonization Avenue. As a community, we need to show a higher level of inclusiveness with our First Nation citizens. The offensive nature of the name of the street has been ignored for far too long. I look to you as counsel to support this request for change. Thank you. Well, that is our presentation. Um, again, I thank the Working Circle for all of the all of the difficult work and the hard discussion that we've had around this issue. And uh, I definitely thank the community members who are supporting uh, our recommendation as well. Which is a Dali Thank you for listening today. Um, thank yeah. you, uh, everyone. And if there's questions, we would entertain. Sorry, we're shot on my change. I didn't say anything yet tonight. So first of all, I just want to thank uh, Councilor Shane McKinnon, Cheryl, the Working Circle. Uh, fantastic presentation, and uh, you know, in the short time the Working Circle has been in, in existence, I mean, we've gone from a land acknowledgement, and we're now working on this. And I think that's such a positive step for our city, and a positive step for our citizens. And um, you know, back a few, I can't remember, a few years ago, when we first brought this up. I needed to be educated to what this actually meant. And you've more than done that uh, tonight, and I've done my own research. So uh, thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, any other comments from anyone? Councillor Bush? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of comments. Um, just like to thank uh, Shane and Cheryl for the excellent presentation and the rest of the working circle for all the work that, uh, that went into uh, went into this and I, I think we all recognize we can't change the past and uh, to that end I think a lot of us weren't really necessarily all that familiar with um, the details of the past certainly from an indigenous perspective but we can affect the future 
And I know we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, colonization avenue later in this meeting when we talk about the name change policy, but you know, as council considers the recommendation of the working circle, I would just suggest we go back and consider our strategic plan and the mandate of the working circle that Shane uh, talked about at the outset of um, the presentation. And just remind ourselves that one of our strategic goals as a council was to continue to foster positive relationships with Indigenous peoples and neighbouring First Nations communities. So again, this presentation, uh, excellent presentation by you two, uh, was all, all in the direction of, it, again, fostering those positive relationships. So again, as we go forward in the next uh, portion of this discussion later on in the meeting, I just ask council to uh, consider the strategic plan and uh, basically the uh, initiatives that we have uh, put in front of ourselves. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Anyone else? Uh, Councilor Price? You're muted. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Councillor uh, McKinnon and uh, Cheryl Edwards for doing the presentation and doing such a great job um, on giving some of the history on Colonization Avenue. Um, I um, implore the residents of, of the City of Dryden to take a moment and, and watch the documentaries, uh, read the information provided, and educate yourself on the meaning of colonization. Um, with the information provided, um, I was able to sit down and um, really educate my, myself on, on what the true meaning of colonization and came to the realization that now is the time for change. Um, I um, believe that um, with this street name, um, we should have that hashtag, now is the time for change 2021. It's a, a new year and, it, and it's time for something good to happen. And hopefully with this, um, we will lead the way for other communities across our great country to make the same change. All right, thank you. Anyone else? All right, uh, Councilor McKay. Yeah, I'd like to say that uh, I'd like to thank Shane and Cheryl for their uh, presentation. And, and you know, Council, I, I, I'm in a unique position of uh, living on colonization and having uh, about the enemy for many years and this is very very uh, a good thing that's happening that we're considering right now and, and it's uh, very much uh, overdue. I want to thank all of the working circle for bringing this to us tonight. Uh, very positive. Thanks. Comment uh, Councillor Carlucci? I go ahead Councillor Aaron Mayor Wilson. Thank you. I guess uh, I've realized I wasn't on the screen, so you couldn't see my hand up. Uh, I just wanted to encourage uh, Dryden Knights citizens that uh, council really isn't seeking to to railroad its citizens into making a certain decision for particular outcomes in any way, however you look at this. But true conciliation really can only happen through transparent public dialogue. So the, the recommendation that, that was presented to council, it said uh, council, that council direct municipal staff to issue public notice stating city council's intention to rename Colonization Avenue and seek public input for a period of 60 days after which city council will consider the proposed names. And it continues on, but I just wanted to remind and encourage citizens that, uh, that we're seeking public input regardless of what your opinions and your views are, as long as they're respectful, we do want to hear from you. So uh, it's very important for democracy to make sure that, that all voices can be heard. So I, so I encourage everyone. And, um, and I also, I watched, uh, I think probably three times the CBC uh, video and of course Lloyd's, I've watched a few times and they were very well done and uh, communicated excellent uh, uh, thoughts and experiences and opinions. So, so thank you for that, Lloyd, and thank you, everyone. All right, thank you, everyone, and thanks again for your presentation. Public, we have no public notices this evening. I would like to ask Ms. Reeder to uh, present her staff report.
through the chair, thank you and good evening members of council. Um, I'm not certain if everyone's had an opportunity to read the report. We do understand that it was rather lengthy. Um, if we wanted to start with any questions or if there were any clarifications required, we can uh, go ahead with that. Any questions? Uh, Councilor Shane McKinnon. Yes, uh, thank you for the report, uh, Ms. Reeder. And I have uh, a number of questions. And uh, the first one is, is in regard to uh, budget, or I should say the lack of uh, financial budgeting uh, in the budget for, for this particular project. Uh, this is a, a, a far reaching uh, project, I think, that covers a lot of area in the community. And it's, and I think it's really vital to the community. Uh, but I, I don't quite understand uh, why we have no budget for this at the outset. As, as I understand it, and I think you may be an expert on this, um, is that even Ignis, uh, who's a participant in this particular plan, has set aside annualized dollars uh, for, um, for their community uh, well-being and safety program. Is that correct? Okay, uh, thank you, Councilor McKinnon. McKinnon, through the chair, I'm going to um, the 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 community well-being fund that you're likely referencing for the township of Ignace um, is a significant fund that they receive from a third-party funder, and so those dollars are set uh, aside specifically for community well-being, um, and that is. Uh, again, like I said, from a third party funder. So the majority of the municipalities in our region just don't have access to, to that type of fund. Um, you know, in addition to the um, dedicated annual um, budgeting for things such as social service levies, police fire services, um, public health levies, those types of things that uh, are common expenses for municipalities uh, that contribute to community safety and well-being. Um, that's that's what most municipalities have. That comes out of the operating budget. We, we just most municipalities have not been gifted a significant community well-being um, fund such as that. But having said that, one thing I can say, even as a new employee with the city is that the um, all of the undertakings in the last few years and the projects that we have planned for 2021 um, uh, following up with what uh, Councillor Bush um, referred to earlier in the community safety and well-being plan what we're doing right now in the absence of such a significant fund specifically for community safety and well-being um, we also haven't received any um, provincial or federal funds towards that. So what we're doing right now is every project that we're undertaking, um, including things like pursuing youth-friendly Dryden, age-friendly Dryden, uh, a youth leadership and service learning program, um, uh, and the age-friendly is really a great example that I can and delve into. But what we're doing is in the absence, again, of such a significant fund, we're really leveraging human capital, the good works that are already happening in terms of community safety and well-being in the community, and any other funding opportunities that we may have access to. Uh, I can use the age-friendly community um, action plan um, pursuit as, as an example of that. We were really, that funding opportunity just, um, that came up rather quickly. We were able to submit a good application, um, thanks to the support of council also. But really that came about um, in terms of what I was referencing earlier about leveraging the good works in the community. Despite not having access to a fund specific to community safety and well-being, the community really of Dryden has been working since 2016 to advance community safety and well-being prior to it becoming a, a mandated requirement from the, the, the province. So because of those works that have been done, what we were able to do was re, uh, re leverage human capital, uh, um, submit this application for funding. We received nine letters of support. While we would like to be able to say we can just, um, you know, set aside funds from the operating budget specifically towards community safety and well-being, the majority of municipalities just aren't in that position. So what we're doing is leveraging human capital, again, work, and 
any funding application that that becomes available we're applying for. A recent example was the same third party funder that provides this community well-being fund for the township of Ignace. We were we were invited to apply um, for some limited um, specific youth um, project funding and because of the work that was happening at the youth pillar and really through a partnership with um, a number of organizations in the community and um, our community services managers involved in that too. He brought that to our attention. I was able to submit an application and we received a, a significant investment to use wellness kits. So, you know, those are the, the uh, types of proactive measures that we're taking um, in the absence again of such a fund. I'm not certain if uh, that responded to you. Sorry, Shane, can I go to uh, Roger first? Go ahead, Roger. Uh, through the chair, thank you. Uh, uh, Councillor McKinnon, it, that's a, that is a really good question uh, regarding budget. But I think we, I think we really want to step back and maybe look at what, uh, what the community uh, safety and well-being uh, plan development and, and initiative you know, really is. And it is a large, uh, a large group of community stakeholders that are coming together to really look at, at uh, areas of concern, areas of need within within the community that affect uh, that affects our safety and our well-being. Uh, we we have you know not just the municipality, but we have law enforcement agencies involved. We have social services involved. We have public health involved. We have healthcare uh, involved. We have faith groups uh, involved in this initiative. We have indigenous organizations. Uh, involved in this initiative, and I'm and I'm missing many, uh, and and really, at at the at the end of the plan development, they're going they're, there's going to be multiple strategies uh, that are that are going to be uh, put in place to try and help deal with some of the some of the critical uh, uh, priority issues that the that the group has identified in the community. Uh, mental health and addiction is one. Uh, affordable housing uh, is another. Youth uh, is another, and and the list goes goes on and on. So when it comes to funding those strategies and and trying to achieve the outcomes that uh, that the plan will identify, uh, it it's really going to be a collaboration of the municipality and those partners uh, funding those initiatives. So right now. We really don't have any specific uh, projects that are that are really targeted for municipal funding, but I do, you know, I, I do want to remind council uh, when it comes to social services, when it comes to public health, when it comes to supporting uh, our, our our aged population in this community, uh, we do dedicate annually uh, budget to those levies to, to really to, to a large a large amount uh, millions uh, annually we also dedicate budget to our public library through our through the uh, operating grant uh, to the public library uh, we dedicate budget to uh, recreation facilities and activities within within the community uh, we have dedicated budget to support the youth center uh, and, and of course, we have dedicated budget to uh, support our municipal law enforcement uh, agency as well as our fire protection uh, services in the community. So from a standpoint of dedicating budget towards uh, community safety and well-being, that, uh, and of course, the treasurer can help me out on my math, but those areas probably represent close to a third of our annual operating budget. So, so the municipality does actually dedicate a large amount of funds annually to uh, to support community safety and, and well-being. Thank, Thank you, you, Roger. Shane, did you have more? Yeah, I, I just it it, it uh, goes along, I think, with the conversation uh, out of the terms of reference. I, I, I'm kind of concerned about the and maybe it's nuanced in there, and, and I'm just not getting it. But uh, I, I look at this organization as they will make recommendations or advocate on behalf of the community to the municipality. And I'll give you an example is if, if there's no funding available for let's say a warming center in the community, and we know that our population of homeless people has um, gone up uh, exponentially and we need a warming center and there's no funding available, do we just abandon that or do we, or does the 
community well-being and safety group um, advocate and, and make recommendations to uh, city council to put the money forward because uh, you know if we're just advocating outside of the uh, the walls of, of city hall uh, that's one thing but I think correct me if I'm wrong this organization looks at issues in the community and how to solve them so it's not always going to be outside of the walls it's a question I guess under the terms of reference I just don't see it in there I see advocating other organizations regional I think it says and provincial and federal but not the municipality itself so am I missing something Roger uh, uh, through the chair it unless uh, miss reader wants to field this question I'd, I can I can field that as well mm -hmm. Yes, thank you, through the chair. Um, the role of the Joint um, Community Safety and Wellbeing Advisory Committee really is through the pillar working group. So um, that is the terms of reference, again, that will be provided to council for your information. Uh, the working groups are just reviewing those right now. But really that's where the, the, the real work occurs is at those four tables. Um, so recommendations, because each pillar working group has a mandate, um, they will be developing work plans, um, again, identifying those priority needs. That will be informed by the community survey that will be um, distributed in the very near future. So all of that will inform those work plans of the pillars. The pillars will submit their work plans to the advisory committee, who will then review um, and you know identify the priority areas, um, explore certain uh, recommendations that the pillar working groups have made, um, have those kinds of conversations, invite um, other persons um, with specific areas of expertise that they may need some input and guidance on um, to, you know, to, to finalize the recommendations. Those recommendations then will be brought forward to each council for council to approve the direction moving forward. But really, the, the idea is that when those recommendations come forward to the councils, that the research has been done, the information, the best possible solutions have been explored, that councils provided some options for uh, responding uh, and making those choices. So that, that's really the, the idea behind the advisory committee, is that council receives the data that they need to make those decisions. Thank you. Councillor Bush. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the um, presentation and the update. And just uh, just looking at uh, what at the presentation, but also uh, your comments, uh, Miss Reader, about about the mandate of the council or the committee. It, it seems to me that the city isn't necessarily always going to be the default funding provider. It seems to me that a lot of the activities that the um, Community Safety and Wellbeing Committee are going to do is to help focus the various groups that are involved in providing those supports into, into more targeted efforts to really deal with the issues that the Community Safety and Wellbeing Committee is dealing with. It may be at some point that there's a that there's a request to City Council for something the City can do, but it's also in my mind just that equally uh, possible that things for a warming center, for example, might best be funded through KDSB and their various avenues if they consider that as part of their mandate that a warming center is needed, just as an example. So I, I think we need to be careful as a council not to just accept the city as the default funder, but to look to see how the various agencies already providing a lot of this support, perhaps better in, in a more targeted way, working with the Community Health and Safety Committee uh, really looks at how that funding and where that funding comes from for a specific need. So I guess I'd be looking forward to seeing what recommendations are coming down the pipe because we do we do know that we've got a lot of social issues and uh, we do know that a lot of things have to change if we're going to improve the safety of this community. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Councillor Bush? Yep. Yes, I do just have a question. Uh, for the past three years or so, Inspector Tachuk has been presenting uh, our community's safety and well-being plans 
are you taking over this role? I just was not clear because it basically was being looked after by representatives of DPS in terms of the lead. So, Marshalline, are you now the lead on this? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Councillor Bush, for your question. I am not. I am um, just the city's uh, community safety and well-being liaison. Perhaps right. Roger would like to expand on yeah. that. Uh, yeah. Through the chair. So, so currently, Councillor Bush, the the co-chairs uh, that that uh, have been uh, co-chairing the community safety and well-being initiative are are still in place. Now, uh, this could change when we when we. Uh, uh, bring in the new advisory committee structure. Uh, the the uh, chair of that committee will will have to be chosen. Uh, there's nothing there's nothing that states that it can't be the same. You know, one of the co-chairs that are in existence now, but uh, but that could change in the not too distant future. Okay, thank you. Any other comments, Marcelina? How are you? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I am good. Thank you. Unless anyone else has any questions or concerns. All right. So we have three recommendations. We're gonna we bring that forward. Yep. Good. All right. Thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. I'd like to call Ms. Skillen to present her staff report. Uh, good evening. Um, so through the chair, uh, my staff report is basically to notify and to ask that council accept uh, a zoning bylaw application that's been received from Kayla Jonason on behalf of Marie Savage of the Dryden Community Funeral Home. Uh, the address is 249 Grand Trunk Avenue and I would ask that uh, council direct staff, so direct the building and planning staff to hold a virtual public meeting date yet to be decided uh, the public meeting specifically to present the zoning bylaw amendment information and to give the public an opportunity to make presentations in respect of the proposed bylaw um, the date for the public meeting is yet to be determined um, city staff are investigating and testing an appropriate meeting platform with which we can conduct it. So until at such time we have that confirmed, we will then decide on what that public date will be. Uh, just a little bit of a review on the background for everybody's information. So in 2018, we specifically allowed uh, permitted use of the funeral home parlor on this highway commercial zone. Uh, it wasn't in existence at that time, so it was a correction of the use of that zone. Um, in 2019, uh, early 2019, we received an application to amend this bylaw again, uh, which was received specifically to um, permit a crematorium as an accessory use to the permitted funeral home within this highway commercial zone. Um, throughout 2019, we then proceeded, you know, through the legislative process. Uh, we had one scheduled public meeting one open committee of the whole, and lastly, one special open council meeting. Uh, public meeting was in August. The committee of the whole meeting was on October. And additionally, there was a special open committee of the whole meeting uh, a few days after that. Um, a recommendation report was brought forward based on the previous public uh, meetings um, after review from the planners um, that essentially deemed the application still in good standing and that based on the planning act the provincial policy statement as it relates to our official plan and the zoning bylaw uh, there was um, no objection from city staff to the approval of that bylaw amendment uh, since that was done um, and before a decision was rendered at the end of august uh, the then owner mr robert savage um, officially withdrew his amendment application. So no decision had to be rendered at that time. Uh, since then, a new application uh, for this same amendment has been received uh, by Kayla as well, uh, but on behalf of Marie Savage, who is the successor to this business um, in August of this year. The application was thoroughly reviewed um, by our municipal planning consultants 
And on December 23rd, they uh, notified me that everything was in place and they deemed it complete. The application is identical to that proposed in 2019. Uh, but it is completed with updated engineering reports uh, from 2020. Um, and, you know, otherwise its purpose is the same as to permit a crematorium on that property. Um, again, you know, all the standard reviews do happen. Uh, it's legitimation, uh, legitimizing its uh, position with provincial policy statement. It, it is consistent with all the policies and it abides by all the rules and regulations set out as the legislation uh, and the Planning Act dictate. So at this point in time, uh, you are in possession of everything, uh, some of the past information reports, the current uh, emissions and acoustic reports, as well as land use compatibility guide. Um, although this particular presentation to Council tonight is not actually a requirement of legislation. Um, automatically, when we deem an, an application complete, we can proceed to a public meeting. But due to its nature in our community and the fact that it is a uh, highly contentious issue, it is a concerning issue, um, I wanted to present this just like I did in 2019 to Council to be able to provide that information publicly to both Council as well as our members uh, in the community and give everybody the utmost time to review it and to be able to you know, decide. And, and I guess because of our nature this year of having to do things virtually, there is that, addition, uh, that additional concern for presentation and, um, and, and participation. So if anybody has any questions, um, really, I'm just looking forward to or looking for uh, everybody to be, you know, in alignment that we will proceed as for the legislation and head to a public meeting once we're ready to do so. Okay. Thank you. Can't hear who's talking. Now, Councilor Shane McKinnon. <laughs> Thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Gillen, for your report. Um, I just have uh, one question. Uh, has anything changed uh, in that area since the application was abandoned uh, uh, as far as zoning or development? <laughs> So through the chair, uh, no no specific zoning has changed in that area at all. Uh, when we were first uh, set the application, uh, what I did was I had a specific conversation with them to advise them that the lands behind them had been purchased for residential development and that they were to ensure that communication was given to their engineers so they could take that into consideration when they provided their reports. So really, outside of that particular change, nothing else has uh, has altered in that area. And does that change the proximity to residential potential residential buildings? It it certainly could. Um, now the only thing that happens in there is yes, it brings residential closer to that development, but it does not and has not changed the engineer's report with respect to their sensitive uses and proximities. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKay. People that are uh, looking at developing the property behind, you know, the uh, where the crematorium is proposed, uh, have they been notified of this uh, zoning request change or whatever? So through the chair. Um, tonight was specifically just to bring the application and everything forward. Once we get to the point of we actually sending out the notices for the public meeting, then everybody within 120 meters of that property receives a notice. So they, of course, would be included in that. Additionally, in that notice notification process, anybody from 2019 that specifically requested communications are also a part of that notification process. Uh, Mary Wilson. Yes, thank you. I was just really wanting to caution councillors not to uh, inject yourselves individually into the process we're, we're going to embark on, on, apart from, of course, 
chambers when you you know we discuss publicly and so on and so forth but uh, just to make sure you don't get off on your own um, dialogues with with individuals uh, and that's just standard standard caution uh, sending out to counselors thank you thank you mayor wilson uh, any other comments questions so we move to a public meeting is that they will forward yes if that's okay. we'll have to wait until Ms. skillen has a meeting platform set up that can be done and then we'll schedule a public meeting all right thank you pam thank you i would like to ask mr Poole to present his staff reports uh thank you to the chair council staff and residents listening in I have four reports uh, this evening. They're uh, yearly reports I bring forward at the beginning of each year. Uh, these tenders uh, that I'm going to uh, discuss were all opened on December 16th, 2020. And just to let you know that successful bidders are the same for 2021 as they were in 2020. Um, I'll just read off the recommendation for the tender for supply of sand and gravel for the city. Uh, the council accepts the recommendation to award the tender for the supply of sand and gravel for 2021 to RB Ross Tech Construction Limited, being the lowest bidder in the amount of $106,525, excluding applicable taxes. And it's understood that the amount is based on estimated quantities and final payment on this tender is calculated based on actual quantities. Uh, and just to let you know, uh, there was no difference in pricing this year as compared to last year. All right, questions, uh, Councillor Bush? Uh, yes, through the chair. Um, Mr. Poole, is Rostec the only bidder or I just see one, one number here? yeah yeah you are correct uh we did uh, also well we put it on our website but we also reached out to the the other uh companies within the city that uh, typically do bid on this um i did reach out to one of them uh yesterday and uh their reasoning was uh covid issues uh they've had some other internal issues going on and then also uh, rostec tends to get <laughs> be the low bidder uh, consistently so they didn't have time to really put in a bid for it either all right okay thank you yeah. thank you blake any other questions comments next report okay this uh, the next report is a ten tender for supply of clear diesel fuel and this is uh the council accept the recommendation toward this tender for the supply of clear diesel fuel at the pump for the year 2021 to master angelo fuels of dryden being the lowest bidder with a price at the pump of a uh, dollar three per liter uh, there was two bids on this one and but the prices have also dropped uh, significantly i would say from last year for the fuel prices and this is for uh, picking it up at the pumps Great. Any questions, comments? Seeing none, okay, Blake. Okay. Uh, the third report is the tender for a supply of unleaded gasoline. Uh, this is also uh, for supply of uh, unleaded gasoline at the pump for the year 2021. Uh, the award would be to Morgan Fuels of Dryden being the lowest bidder with a price at the pump of uh, $1 uh, and two 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 and third cents, I guess. Um, this is also uh, lower pricing than last year. And just to let you know, uh, the supply of the, the fuel from uh, the clear diesel and the unleaded gasoline, uh, in case of a citywide emergency or uh, power outage and, and, uh, or anything like that, they have the capability to supply our vehicles uh, with fuel if there is any type of outage or during an emergency and that is requirement as part of uh, their tendering process for this uh, for fuel supply thank you any comments questions seeing none okay blake okay this is the tender for fuel delivery for 2021 
Um, we have fuel delivery for uh, Mark Diesel fuel, and that's at the public works yard. And there's also unleaded gasoline at the airport as well. Um, the recommendation is that council accepts the recommendation to award the tender for the supply and delivery of gasoline for 2021 to Morgan Fuels, who to overall the lowest bidder with the following price. It was $1 per liter. And that council accept the recommendation to award the tender for the supply and delivery of number 2D S15 Mark Diesel fuel for 2021 to Master Angelo Fuels, who overall was the lowest bidder with the following prices, including applicable taxes, and that was 94 cents per liter. Um, these numbers are also uh, lower than they were for the last couple of years, so uh, hopefully we're going in the right direction here as it's been going up the last couple of years, so now it's uh, come back down. So, uh, and that's my report on that. So. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Blake. Any comments, questions on the last one? All right, seeing none. Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to call, ask Ms. Eiler to present her staff report. Yes, uh, my staff report uh, references one that I did last month regarding on street parking in the downtown core. It's been discovered uh, since then that I made an error in the time shown on Schedule C, which deals with restricted parking and that needs to be corrected. Uh, it currently shows the time for restricted parking as being from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m., where it should be 8 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., which is what's indicated in section 150.15 of the bylaw. In order to enforce the revised restricted parking rules, it's necessary to amend the bylaw that was adopted in December to correct the times indicated on Schedule C and the goal would be to bring the revised bylaw to council on January 25th. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Great, seeing none. I'd like to ask Mr. Nesbitt to present his staff report. Uh, thank you, and through the chair. So, uh, Miss uh, Miss Edwards and Councillor Shane McKinnon, I think, stole most of the thunder out of <laughs> out of my report. Uh, they did such a good job on that presentation. But I will go through a few highlights in the recommendation for the staff report. Uh, my staff report is bringing forward the uh, municipal street renaming application uh, for the uh, recommendation to rename Colonization Avenue coming from the working circle. So our recommendation is that council accept the municipal street naming application submitted by the working circle. Uh, that council direct municipal staff to issue public notice uh, stating city council's intention to rename Colonization Avenue and seek public input for a period of 60 days. And that council direct the working circle to, en to encourage the public through various means to submit suggestions for uh, street names during the 60 day public notice period and at, at the end of which the working circle will, will report back to city council and provide a short list of street names for consideration by City Council. So not, uh, not taking time to dive through my entire report, I do, wanna, I do wanna call out a couple of sections uh, in the report, and namely uh, some of the excerpts that, uh, that I've taken uh, from the pamphlet the Council has titled Time for Change, and, and included those in the report. And I'm going to read the first one. First one reads, colonization means the action or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area and appropriating a place for one's own use. I think that definition uh, says an awful lot. Uh, and, and I think I would encourage council and, and the members of, of our public, our residents of Dryden, uh, to really think about the meaning of colonization in that context and, 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 and look at it through the perspective of uh, an Indigenous person that experienced that. The second expert, uh, excerpt from the pamphlet reads, a street name should be something we all take pride in as we do our greater community. For too many, Colonization Avenue is a daily reminder of a dark stain in Canadian history <clears throat> and of past injustice injustices that stand in the way of making all people feel like an important part of the fabric of our community. If you, if you think of that statement in terms of the uh, community strategy, the municipal strategy plan that this council and staff have put in place, 
uh, and, the, and the goals that we have within that strat plan to really uh, promote and strengthen our relationships with Indigenous people. Having colonization used in a municipal asset name really, really does not promote achieving those goals. And it really does not promote moving reconciliation efforts ahead in this, in this community. With that said, uh, the municipal, uh, municipal asset naming policy um, it does, it, it, within the policy, it does state that the applicant must provide documented support, uh, including but not limited to petitions and support letters from at least 75% of the property owners that abut uh, the street that's, that's being proposed to be renamed. Uh, however, <clears throat> the policy also states at the discretion of municipal staff, uh, this requirement uh, may be waived and the application be presented directly to council. So based on the nature of this uh, particular application and the rationale that's being provided uh, by the working circle, staff have chosen to, uh, to waive this requirement and hence council is, is having the application in front of them tonight. If council accepts the proposed uh, street naming application and provides direction uh, to staff, the city uh, will provide public notice of its intention to rename Colonization Avenue and seek public input for the 60-day period. Uh, following that notice period, City Council uh, uh, will consider the submitted uh, input and the proposed street names. If, if members of public or members of Council wish to see any of the rationale, any of the education material, uh, any of the reference material, including the videos uh, d that were put together by uh, Mr. Napish, uh, the CBC video that Council Shane McKinnon mentioned, all of that information can be found on the city's website at dryden.ca slash working circle. So I encourage members of the public, I encourage council uh, to go to the website to have a look at, at all of that background, that education uh, material. There's instructions uh, again at, uh, on the, uh, the web page that uh, would help, uh, you know, should the uh, uh, name change go forward. Uh, there's instructions to help with address uh, changes through uh, different organizations and such. Uh, all of that reference material is on the city website. So I encourage the public to, to go and, and read through it, to watch the videos, and to, and to really uh, put yourself in, into, into somebody else's shoes and look at this recommendation through another perspective. And I think when individuals do that, this will make a lot of sense. Thank you. Uh, through the chair, so we're. Uh, how about now? No idea what's going on. How about now? So Roger, direction for us? Uh, through the chair, you may want to ask for questions again or comments. Oh, okay. questions, comments? Also Shane, sorry. Go ahead, Shane. You're muted. Shane, yep. Thank you. I, I just want to say that I'm very encouraged by Council's reaction and leadership. Uh, to this particular issue and and uh, I remind myself that this is uh, 2021 not 1921 um, and I'm very hopeful that we can do the right thing and and change the name of colonization and really change it to a name that's uh, worthy of our, our diverse community and the times we, we live in so I want to thank council for uh, for their attention to this thank, thank you. you anyone else All right, so Roger, direction that you want us to? Uh, through the chair, we're, we're looking for direction from, uh, from council first to accept the application and then instruct uh, staff to issue public notice that council 
uh, Will, you know, Will have the intention to, to change the name and is looking for public uh, input as well as seeking uh, uh, proposed names, new names for Colonization Avenue. And, and to also provide direction to the working circle uh, to do that, uh, to conduct those, those uh, uh, public encouragements to, uh, to solicit those, those new uh, street name proposals. Right, so everyone in favor of doing this, hands up or aye. Aye. Can you not hear me? Okay, we're good. You got your direction. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I'd like to ask Mr. Blanchet to present his staff report. Good evening through the chair. Um, good evening, Mayor and Council. Before you see, I have a um, little bit of an update to or an informational report regarding uh, the extended closure of the uh, Dryden Recreation Centre, as well as some opportunities um, should Council so choose to uh, further try to mitigate some of the losses that we may be incurring. So as we're all aware, um, we've gone through now uh, another set of lockdowns on uh, in early or late December. We were advised of, of our initial one, and late last week we were informed that we'd be experiencing yet another two-week lockdown um, for Northern Ontario. Um, after the first lockdown, we immediately uh, spoke with staff here and, and identified as many opportunities as we possibly could to remain busy and reduce these costs, and again, we were forced to do so early in 2021 not exactly the hope um you know that we had to start off 2021 but it is here and i appreciate uh, the safety concerns involved so um during that time um, i provided a, a bit of a list here of some of the activities that we've been uh, that we accomplished during that first shutdown but you'll also note that there's been a significant amount of uh, vacation time and holiday time that was used during that period um which was fantastic, and I, I'd like to, you know, make note of that because uh, the staff were aware of the situation. They understood where we were last summer when we shut down and uh, what we were faced again with right now. So, although holidays in early January are not always a top pick for uh, for staff, uh, I, I'm really pleased to see that everyone took a look at, at an opportunity here to try to reduce these costs for the department. So again, um, I've attached a list of some of the activities that uh, did take place and some of them that will continue to take place over the next two weeks. I've also provided a couple of options, or, or uh, a option one, uh, on about removing the ice in rink two. At this point, um, it's safe to say that we're no longer gonna be uh, hosting any tournaments at the latter half of this winter. That being said, um, ICE 2 is in, and it is required at this time to continue the amount of programming that we're offering now. All of our user groups do use Rink 2 at one point or another, and although I'd like to be able to say we could shift everyone over to Rink 1 with no disruption and remove the ice and save some dollars, um, that really isn't quite the case. Um, and uh, another, a second option, and hopefully not one for at this time, would be the, uh, the total removal of ice from the complex. I'm hoping that um, council doesn't really take this one into consideration at this time. Maybe premature, we are at the start of January and uh, we're hoping that once we get through this, we'll be able to resume the rest of the season um, you know, as normal. Also like to mention that uh, we have been in touch with our user groups throughout this process after the first shutdown and again our second one, try to get a feel on, on what they're thinking of their own operations. All user groups can tend to, uh, uh, have intentions of continuing on through the season and most of them are also understanding that they've collected registration fees from um, their users for, uh, for a season and they intend to you know, deliver on that and possibly extend for a couple of weeks to try to make up for the lost time. So again, um, I provided a little bit of numbers here for you on, on what it would look like or what our revenues were expected for the pool as well for the arena and uh, you know what we've tried to do over on this time. Most of our efforts at this point have been uh, we're taking care of with utility setbacks and just simply shutting off everything that we can at this point to ensure that uh, our consumption levels are, are as low as possible. Of course, all student staffing positions and uh, part-time staffing positions have or uh, shifts have been cancelled at that time. Only full-time staff are operating now. Thank you, Steve. Any questions, comments? 
Uh, Councillor Bush. Yes, uh, thank you through the chair. Thank you for your uh, report, Steve. Just, um, it, it's not totally clear to me what the financial impact of the current lockdown is on Parks and Rec when you do all the additions and subtractions around revenue and, uh, and costs. So if we were to take the ice out, for example, how much would we save? And on the flip side of that, how much is this extra lockdown time actually costing the city? Yeah. Um, it would be difficult to say just because of the consumption and on what we're going to be, you know, on what we would be saving on hydro, um, regardless if we have the ice in, it's still a very big building that needs to be heated at some level and the same thing with our pool. So there's always going to be a over on that end. Um, I guess the biggest thing we'd be looking at if we were to remove the ice at this time is, uh, is a possibility of laying off staff. The, the greatest, you know, savings, of course, um, would result in in laying off staff at this time We're hoping that's not the case just again we are early january but as we noted uh, or as i tried to note on there um we had about you know just shy of twelve thousand dollars for forecasted revenues for the period that we are closed at this time and over on the pool side we were at about sixty two hundred dollars for this two week period there so you know we're under twenty thousand um, dollars in revenues well, just under twenty thousand dollars in projected revenues that are potentially lost at this time uh, again by reducing our changing our set points over on the arena the amount of fuel that's going on no student staffing be it life or get students i'm thinking we're able to reduce that cost to about half and we'd be somewhere around that ten thousand dollar mark when we come out of this also important to note that we are two days into this already and uh you know therefore we've got a balance of 12 days provided we're able to open again on the other end that answer your question, Councillor Bush? Councillor Bush, another question? Yes, through, through the chair. I, yeah, so I, I think that answers my question. So it's probably around $8,000, give or take a bit, that this two weeks has cost us. And I, I noted your um, 87000 that we got uh, at the end of last year. Um, it, it just seems to me, it just seems to me, uh, from my perspective only as one councillor, that... Um, Maybe it's a bit premature to make this kind of a decision. Maybe we should see what the province is going to do in terms of extending lockdowns or whatever to see if we can get a better vision of the horizon. I kind of hate to shut things down from my perspective for 8000 bucks, not knowing if that's all it's going to be. If it's going to morph into something that's much longer term, I think we have a different discussion. At least that's my perspective. Absolutely. And I would like to uh, also know I've listed that uh, annually we go into a summer shutdown over on the uh, the pool and fitness side. This year, because we've, re we've installed brand new carpet uh, at, in December over on that end, we're taking care of a lot of them items right now. We will not have a summer shutdown. We're doing as much as we can to handle all of those maintenance tasks at this point. So we'll be, we'll be open for that extra, you know, week and a bit that we're normally down in the summer to, to try to recoup some of these revenues. We're, we've simply shifted our shutdown. From, from summer uh, to January. Good to move, thank you. And Councilor Shane McKinnon. Yes, uh, thank you for your report, uh, Mr. Belanger. And, and I just uh, wonder if you have talked to colleagues or can Crystal Ball a further uh, relief, COVID relief funding uh, package. Is that something that's been discussed? I think we were all pleasantly surprised by the funding that we got in December so I, I thought the communication was uh, municipalities had to prepare for this moving forward knowing that you know 2021 could be difficult and uh, I, I believe that there was an email from our treasurer that, that even and maybe our CAO that mentioned this was a little bit of a surprise and uh, we're all you know so I, I don't know if I would expect it that being said uh, I don't know if all the municipalities were expecting again to be uh, shut down the way we are and and I, I suppose there's always a possibility that the government steps back up to the plate for 2021 might be full of surprises so let's be hopeful <laughs> Mayor Wilson hi uh, yes uh, thanks uh, Steve I was just wondering there was a First Nation organization that uh, contacted me back before Christmas just saying indicating that they were quite interested in having a tournament uh, in 
in March, and I'm assuming that you were in touch with them. Uh, was it their decision as well that they would not want to come now in in March? Um, the Northern Bands and the Little Bands tournaments made those decisions pretty well on their own. I think they forecasted that this wasn't really going to get better anytime soon, um, you know, or feeling comfortable enough that they were ready to uh, bring all of their communities down, you know, at this time this winter. So they, they did that one on their own and uh, made that decision. And that also eliminates, uh, or, you know, or, or decreases that need for Rink 2. And as I've listed in the report, uh, this will be the earliest that we ever pull out Rink 2, um, which is around mid-March when the curling season is open, things start to slow down. And because we're not going to be hosting any major events like that that requires both ice surfaces, It'll allow us to pull that out, and uh, as the warmer weather arrives, we'll be we'll be holding on to one ice surface and not two, and that that will make a substantial difference on our utilities. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Steve. I, I tend to agree with uh, Councillor Bush. I think it's kind of premature, and we sort of uh, wait this out a bit to see what happens, and it's really out of our hands at this point. So let's we'll see if the government uh, decides. Thank you. Hey, thank you. This is for information only, I'm assuming, so we're all good to go. All right, we have no notices of motion this evening. Uh, comments? I'll start with uh, Mayor Wilson, please. Uh, nothing to report or comment on tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Councillor Bush. Yes, thank you, Councillor Carlucci. Um, firstly, I just hope everybody is enjoying this nice March weather out there. And I encourage all the ice fishers to uh, be careful. There's some punky ice here and there, and uh, probably some water flowing, but we wouldn't expect it in January. And secondly, I just would like to thank all of my colleagues on the working circle for all the good work that's um, culminated in bringing forward uh, a process for renaming colonization potential process. We still have to vote on that probably in April. And uh, certainly for the land acknowledgement. So again, thank you to my colleagues on the working circle and thank you to council for your uh, considered responses and questions. Uh, Councilor Shane McKinnon. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, uh, first of all, I've been remiss in not thanking someone for their service uh, to the city and, and to our community. And uh, I would like to thank Adrian Bone for over 20 years of service in the Provincial Offenses Office. Adrian, uh, as you might be aware, took the helm in the office during the transfer of responsibilities uh, from the province to three partner municipalities. But uh, certainly through her hard work and organization, our city has reaped millions of dollars in financial benefit uh, from that arrangement with little fanfare or recognition. So thank you, Adrian, for your uh, dedication and please enjoy peace and uh, much happiness in your retirement. Um, lastly, uh, I'm just uh, very concerned about uh, people in crisis in our community and in the region. Uh, the normal bonds of, of support that uh, we all enjoy have been altered certainly by COVID-19. Um, a lot of people have been distanced from family and friends uh, or even places of uh, common comfort, whether that's a, a gym or a church or a library. And um, If you know of someone who is struggling, uh, who may need help, uh, please reach out to them or call for help on their behalf. Uh, and I have a number here is 1-866-888-8988 for uh, crisis response. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Price. You're muted, Michelle. Not much to say. <laughs> just uh, wanted to remind everyone to just stay uh, safe and healthy and uh, hopefully we can get back on track uh, at the end of the month. Thank you. Uh, Councilor McKay. Good. And myself as well, I'm good, and I apologize for the mic issues, but uh, yeah, I am soft-spoken, but I guess not uh, a little too much today. As the clerk, uh, 
like uh, we need adjournment. Certainly. So I'd be looking for someone to move and second the motion to adjourn, please. Councillor Price. Sorry, Councillor McKinnon. No. Sorry, Matt, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, to, through the chair, Councillor Martin McKinnon hasn't had an opportunity to speak. Oh, is it on? Oh, sorry, Martin. Oh, sorry, Martin. Okay. I didn't know you were there. We didn't know he was there. Yeah. at the end of some line somewhere. <laughs> sorry, I just saw your name now. Go ahead. I don't, I don't really have much to say tonight. I'd just like to, uh, to thank all my, all my fellow councillors and all the people in the room for the, for the good work that they do. Uh, and also the hard work that we do, because we're, we're about to embark on some, uh, some hard decisions in, in 2021 that, that affect our community. And uh, it's, it's going to take some good work to, to get done what we need to do. A quick comment on uh, community well-being. And uh, I've studied that for the past three years, and I've, I've attended many, many meetings. And it's a huge conglomerate of, of uh, social services, police, city employees. It's, uh, it's very, very well thought out. Uh, financially, we pay money, every, we pay a levy every month that is to go to covering situations like homelessness and that. So that becomes part of our, our deal to lobby those organizations for, for that support. And that's done through your councillors. And don't think that lobby doesn't go on every month. It does go on every month. But the, the fine work that's done on that comes from the Northwest Health Unit, the Kenora District Services Board, who are very well aware of those situations in our community. And they have a lot better chance at funding and finding funding than, than a city would have. It's just the nature of the beast. So don't ever think that this isn't a good thing that, that, uh, that we're doing and it's being built for us. And yes, it's for the city, but yes, it is those organizations that will run it with, with our approval. So it, in the end, it'll come back to, to us councillors and Merrick to lobby to get what we need for the community. That's the pressure we bring to bear. And we'll do that just fine. And it's a lengthy process and it's hugely impacted right now by COVID-19. Everybody in the world's after provincial government and federal government for money for something. And they're, they're doing their best to get us funding for homeless shelters and those kind of things. It takes time, and I'm sorry. There's a huge need out there. But we'll get there, folks. It'll be our, high, our hard work that gets us there. So thank you again for all the work you put in. You're doing amazing things in the working circle. Keep up the good work, everybody. I'm proud of you. Thanks, Martin. Sorry, I, I didn't see you down there, but uh, I'm glad you're on with us. Elsa, we'll try that again. So Call for adjournment. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Price, would you still like to move the motion to adjourn? Certainly. Okay, and I need somebody to second that motion as well. Councillor Martin, since we know you're there now, we'll let you second it. Can I apologize for my lateness. <laughs> the okay. internet doesn't like me. <laughs> Okay. Moved by Councillor Price, seconded by Councillor Martin McKinnon at the meeting to hereby adjourn. All in favor. All right. Okay, thank you.